Uh, evening all. I only found out when I came here that this was being videoed. So I had certain notes. Some of them I'll probably move to the Q&A afterwards, you know. Um, so Patty was saying, look, can you come along? Can you talk about how you got into politics? Can you give a, a good thorough overview of uh, Eurozone economics? And then talk about how an independent TV can influence policy in Ireland and across Europe. You got about 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, it's fantastic to get out of the goldfish bowl uh, that is Leinster House, uh, you know, because politics, of course, is obviously partly about policy and, and hopefully getting some things right, but actually about people. Um, and it's one of the things that I uh, try to do, and I'm sure most TDs try and do as much as possible, is talk to individuals, meet up with groups, and, and, and meet up with you know, a variety of different groups. And most of the groups you meet are groups who are looking for help. You know, they're looking for representation, they're looking for bits and pieces. So it's really nice to be meeting with a group is just like, you know, layer profound wisdom upon us now. Um, uh, so I'm delighted, absolutely delighted to be here. Um, so how did I end up in politics? Uh, when I was 23, I actually lived on this street. Um, I had a broken back. I was long-term unemployed because I had a broken back. Um, and I was an engineer, so I'd come back from MIT I was looking for a job in design. I was out sailing in, in Dunleary Bay, and I cracked my back off a winch handle on a yacht, uh, which really hurt. And uh, so I was out of work for about a year and a half. So I just rang my wife from the other side of the street and said, I'm staring in at the old house that I used to, the old apartment I used to live in. I said, I would have lost a lot of money on anyone telling that unemployed 23-year-old bum that you, know, you were going to be standing across the, across the road as a, as a politician addressing a bunch of bright young things a few doors down. You know? Um, so it was never really on the, on the, uh, on the career path. You know, I, I'm sure as with most people in this room, the career is kind of uh, quite random. And then when you go in to do an interview, you try and create this narrative for exactly why you're <laughs> where you are. For me, I, I was actually in the RDS um, looking for a job. There was a cruise fair on. And I was looking for a job as an engineer back in design. And McKinsey were there. And a guy I'd been at MIT with said, you should check them out. And so I kind of said hello to them and got into the interview process and ended up in London uh, doing interviews. I, I was telling Marion Finucane on the, on the radio on Saturday, um, this is how little I knew. You know, as a young engineer in Dublin, suddenly over in corporate London, and we were sitting in a, in a, in a boardroom. There were 16 of us, and it was myself, two other Irish people, and then uh, the rest of them were these very well-spoken, very well-dressed, very well-educated Oxbridge folk. And they were all those J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley. And, and I said, um, sorry, who is this J.P. Morgan guy? He sounds loaded. <laughs> and uh, one, one, one of the guys kind of looked across and he said, you know, my dear fellow, J.P. Morgan is one of the most prestigious investment banks in the world. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK. I said, just one more question. Uh, so what's an investment bank? <laughs> and he was kind of sitting across from me and he had his glasses and he kind of, kind of folded them onto the table and just went, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Which was an excellent question. Um, so anyway, I took the job and stayed in London and did a bunch of, uh, did a bunch of consulting work. Did it with McKinsey, then left McKinsey, worked for a, a different firm, um, learned a lot, worked very hard, uh, lost my hair. Um, and then I, I was always very interested in public policy. I'm very interested in working in the public sector. And I had tried. I'd kind of uh, spoken to Forfus and spoken to the IDA um, and it, unsuccessfully, entirely unsuccessfully uh, every time. Um, but I, in, in London, started doing work with public sector organizations. So I was doing this work with Transport for London, fantastic study. And I got talking to people who were ex-Kennedy School, so Harvard Kennedy School, Kennedy School of Government, now called the Harvard Kennedy School. And I thought, that's for me. That sounds amazing. So I applied. I got on to McKinsey and said, will you fund us? And they said, yeah. Uh, so I went in uh, 2006. Came back here first, got married, um, partied for a while, uh, hung out with my mum, and uh, went to Kennedy School and spent two of the most incredible years of my life in this place. I used, there's a, Kennedy, the Kennedy School is kind of, it's, you know, across the river is the Harvard Business School. And the Harvard Business School is like something out of you know, some sultan arriving and just dropping gold on a place. The Harvard Business School, I don't know if anyone here has been to the Harvard Business School, it's a palace, you know. They've got kind of chill-out rooms the size of the Kennedy School of Government. So, you know, so that public sector, private sector dynamic is alive and well uh, on the Charles River. Um, 
But the Kennedy School is an amazing place. There's a little kind of courtyard in the middle and a little ramp down, and I used to stop at the top of it every morning and say, never, ever take for granted the fact that you're here. It was extraordinary stuff. You know, you go in and you're being taught by people like Jeff Frankel, who was one of Clinton's economic advisors, uh, uh, Danny Roderick, who's one of the b b best regarded trade economists in the world. You're just being taught by these amazing uh, people. And your classmates are incredible and a lot smarter than you, and they knew a whole lot more about economics than I did. In fact, one of them, my, my study group, there were four of us. There was myself, um, and the other three guys, two of them were, had done a lot of economics, and the other guy was this kind of fizzly brain guy out of MIT, so they were a lot smarter than I was. Um, but as an engineer, I kind of I used to say, well, how does it work? And the uh, Sarosh, the Pakistani guy, sat back one day and he said, you know, Steve, you know the lovely thing about studying with you? I said, no. He said, you're never afraid to ask the really stupid questions that no one else will ask. <laughs> um, so anyway, I finished up in the Kennedy School, did international development, loved it. Um, Talked to Irish Aid about trying to get a job here. They told me they would never hire anybody like me and to go away. Um, uh, so I went back to McKinsey and had, was intending kind of doing the two years you have to do because they fund your, 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 your grad school work, but loved it and stayed in it and began to specialize in organizational design, cultural change, um, was doing some kind of cool charity work, social sector work on the side, some microfinance stuff, some women's empowerment stuff, some volunteering stuff. Um, so my last study in London was helping roll out this quite big new volunteering program aimed at disadvantaged youth in different parts of London. So was really enjoying what I was doing. And uh, my wife rang uh, in 2008 and we're, we're standing in this kind of circular meeting room and looking out at all the signs in, in Piccadilly Circus. And she said, the government's just guaranteed the entire banking system. So I couldn't have done that and kind of checked it and obviously they had. Um, and then, as with everyone else, just kind of watched it unfold on television, and I remember the late Brian Lenehan, who I have huge regard for, or had huge regard for, but I mean, he's a senior counsel. You know, he's not a finance guy, he was very new into the role, saying things like, well, we have to pour all this money into the banks, or the markets will stop lending to us. And watching this on television going, yeah, no, 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 it, not only is that not right, the opposite is true. It's because you're pouring all of our money into the, into the banks that we're going to get locked out of the markets. Um, and when the IMF arrived, uh, I was sitting at home watching six o'clock news, I think it was a Monday, Remember the three guys walking down the street and the beggar? Uh, and I thought, all right, you've got to do something. I uh, didn't know what, how to get involved. I was going to you know, ring one of the parties and say, I don't know, like I'll take two months off work and do whatever you need. Um, and I was at a rugby game. And uh, one of the guys was there. I said, no, you run. Do it. You go in. Uh, and that kind of grew in my, in, in my brain. My wife describes it as a, as a pub rant that got completely out of control. <laughs> Because I wasn't going to the pub. We're two very young kids. We like a, a you know a kid that was a few months old and a kid that was you know a year older than him. So I was never going to the pub. So she's pretty convinced that had we been like leading a normal life, I would have gone to the pub on a Friday, got it out of my system, and then just gone back to work uh, on the Monday. And the most extraordinary thing happened. I said, "Right, I'm going to run," and uh, a group of people said, "Cool, we'll do it with you." And uh, where's Linda? Back there, Linda's friend uh, has just got married in, uh, in America, and he's a guy I didn't know uh, called Bart, who phoned me. He, we, were put in, we were put in touch through a mutual friend called Niall, and uh, we chatted, and he said, cool, I'll give up what I'm doing for a while, and I'll be your campaign manager. He had, he had, run, um, he had run, run a few bits and pieces. And between him and my wife and my friends and family and Bart's friends and family, and everybody we knew and a lot of people we didn't know, um, we pulled off this uh, campaign that kind of, you know, it, it was against the odds. Anyone I had spoken to who knew about politics said, I'm going to run. And I said, you're out of your mind. Um, there was one friend of mine in, in McKinsey who put it very well. He, he, he'd kind of come from a political background. He said, look, here's how it works. First of all, there is no chance that you are going to get elected. The entire system is set up to stop people like you getting in. He said, secondly, even if you do get in, you're going to be an independent TD, and you're going to have absolutely no impact. Um, thirdly, even if one of the parties went mad and took you in, you're going to be a government backbencher, and you're going to have even less impact. Fourthly, even if there was a confluence of events in the lining of the planets, and you somehow managed to get into a cabinet position, you still wouldn't have any impact because the civil servants run the country anyway. <laughs> so um, we had this extraordinary six weeks where... Um, we worked every hour under the sun, and I mean, at one point, I think we had 150 volunteers out on the streets. Um, 
was a friend of mine called Jesse, who I was in grad school with, who'd run Toledo, Ohio for Obama. So when we were trying to figure out how to do this, I mean, when I decided to run, myself and two other McKinsey friends of mine sat down in a room with a load of whiteboards and went, all right, what do you do? You need posters, you need money. I mean, we literally just kind of, none of us had any political experience. We just kind of tried to invent a campaign from the, from the ground up. So we got a video conference with Jesse. Jesse knew all about campaigning. He'd run Toledo, Ohio for the Obama campaign, and we snuck him into the World Bank in DC. Um, and we had this video conference, and I told him I was going to run. And he said, OK, look. He said, if you run a perfect campaign, you will definitely lose, right? Because you're playing other people at their own game. He said, you have no profile. You have no money. You have no organization. You have no manifesto. You have no hair. Like, there is virtually no chance you're going to get elected. He said, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to change the rules of the game. So he came over and did a, did a very surreal training with us in Greystones that Dave McWilliams actually came along to. And they were doing all this American touchy-feely stuff that the Irish obviously were not terribly, terribly comfortable with. Um, but we, 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 we innovated. We did things differently. You know, part of our weakness was we didn't, we'd none of us had any experience in this. But actually, it gave us huge freedom to say, wow, well, what are we, social media, you know, video, town halls, coffee mornings, all sorts of, all sorts of stuff. Um, and after a three-day count, uh, I get in my 112 votes. So that's how uh, I get in. That's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, I was thinking about, I'm going to move on. So Eurozone economics, there is no such thing, really, in my opinion. Um, there is very little economics. There's some smart finance going on in the background. But in terms of economics, um, my experience, which is still very new, I'm only in there two and a half years, it's not like I've had time as an MEP or a load of time in the ECB or anything like that. So take it for what it is, which is I'm slightly more inside the system than you guys, but still very far uh, from, from the center of it. Um, my observation is that the eco so-called economic European response is not an economic response, it's a political response. And the politics is governed by power. So, if you were to analyze the European level response to what has happened in Europe, um, it is a catastrophe. It, it has done all manner of bad and stupid and damaging and long-term damaging things, which is why Nobel economists and the IMF and lots of people, lots of very smart people who understand economics are saying, this is really bad. You do, you're making a lot of mistakes. You're laying the foundation for a lot of social problems. Uh, across Europe for a long time to come. So the question is, well then, well then why? So what actually, what's going on? What's driving these bad decisions? And from what I can see, what's driving them is power, right? This is, this is old fashioned geopolitics playing out in the slightly more polite world of finance and economics rather than the old fashioned battlefield. That's kind of what's, what's going on. If you think about what happened in Ireland, um, we made a huge mistake, which was guaranteeing our banking system. And the Europeans were very angry, particularly the British were very angry, because obviously a load of money then shifted from their banks into our banks, which was, you know, which was bad for them. But very quickly afterwards, when there was a chance for us to roll back on this extraordinary blanket guarantee, then the European political and financial power came to bear. So uh, for example, there were meetings where people were told, if you don't pay us back in full, we will destroy your country. Now, not, po not politically. This is at a financial level, fund at a fund manager level. There was all sorts of financial sector power and threats being brought to bear on the decision makers at the time. And as we know, there was huge political pressure br brought to bear in terms of paying out to all of these people to whom the people of Ireland owed nothing. Um, and it's complicated, and there were reasons for doing some of it and not doing, not doing other bits. But there was a, a piece of analysis I saw the other day, which it's an oversimplification, but it really goes to the heart of it. In 2008, um, German banks had in cash in Irish banks, including the IFSC, so some of it's kind of funny money, 83% um, of their GDP. Right now, I thought I brought along. Bear with me. I know I'm walking off camera here, but if I have it here, I think I brought it along. There we go. Can you grab that for me? All right, check this out. 2008. Right here is here's a load of countries, and here's the money as a percentage of GDP that we have in each other's countries. Here's Ireland, all reds. Right. 
Germany 83%. Now by 2012, that had gone down to 41%. So obviously the, the riskier money came out. But if you want to understand why did, why was there a European response that went against everything we know about economics, everything we know about the free market, the rules of the game, right? The rules of the game are you want to buy bonds in a bank, you want to buy shares in Google, you win, you win. You lose, you lose. But in this case, you lose, you actually win. And remember, they didn't just get their money back. So if you, uh, I was giving a speech in the Dole the other day where I was trying to compare some of the cuts that have come in in this budget around maternity leave, and one that I feel very strongly about, which is the cuts to the under 26s, because I believe it's discriminatory. Regardless of whether it's bad policy, which I believe it is as well, I believe it's at a, at a, at a philosophical level, I believe it's wrong. And I, I, I believe we've, we've crossed the line we shouldn't have crossed. And I was trying to compare you know, the, the government was talking about, well, you have to make these hard decisions. And this is about political leadership and these decisions have to be made. So, well, hang on a second. Sure, we've got we've to we've bring the, the deficit down. And all sorts of horrible decisions have to get made. But the really tough decisions were not paying people we didn't owe any money to. And on those, you acquiesced um, completely. So there was a bond that came due from Anglo, I think it was last February, for about a billion euro. 1.25 billion euro. The bond was bought in 2007, right? And we don't know who bought it. So the current government refuses to investigate who bought the bond, right? So think about this. A professional investor went to Anglo-Irish Bank in 2007 when the OECD and all sorts of people were screaming that the Irish banking system was in trouble and gave them a billion euro and said, we'll take that back at whatever, 4% a year, and then we'll take the full billion back in, in, uh, in, in five years' time. Um, we, the Irish people, paid out not just the billion, but they got their profits. They got their profits as well, which kind of most people don't know about. So that goes against the entire free market. It goes against any concept of, of risk reward. Why did that happen? At a European level, two decisions were made which fundamentally fractured the social contract, which our entire society is built on. One, no European bank will be allowed to fail, right? Uh, that doesn't happen anywhere, any, anywhere else. And two, no senior investor will incur any loss to the capital they invested, nor will they get any reduction in the profits had this thing come through. Um, in my opinion, a lot of this, nothing to do with economics. That is not an economic decision. That chart, largely explains why, uh, it, in, in, in my opinion, obviously it's more complicated than that, but if you want to get down to raw geopolitics and power, which goes against what we understand about economics, those kind of numbers, when a powerful country or a group of powerful countries, right, France had 31% of their GDP in our banks, when that kind of money is at risk, bad things happen to weak countries, and unfortunately, um, I, think that's what, I think that's what happened. So that's, uh, I've, been, I've been going on, but basically Eurozone economics is a proxy for very old school, very standard, very well understood geopolitics. That's what was at play. As far as I can see, that's, um, that's still what's at play. So result for Ireland, uh, bad, pretty much universally bad. Socialization of losses, fracture of the social contract, a complete tearing up of any understanding of how markets are meant to work and how risk and reward is meant to work. Um, and then we're all aware of the social problems. We've got 124% debt to GDP. Uh, in two years' time, our interest on the debt is going to be over 9 billion euro. Um, that is unsustainable. It doesn't mean we're going to default on it, but economists define unsustainable debt not as cannot be paid, but as it will act as a very serious break on the socioeconomic development and future prosperity of your country. Is over nine billion in interest a year in two years' time going to do that? Of course it is. So, so that's what happens. Um, the result for Europe, I would say, is good and bad, right? If we kind of compare 2008, 2009 to, to, to now. So I just kind of, when I was putting my notes together, I, I thought three positives for Europe, for, for all of us, I, I think, in Europe. Coordination of budgets of member states, I think, is a good thing. We've moved to this thing called the European semester. Um, the government is going out of its way to strip the benefits of that from the doll. So the way it's meant to work is everyone submits a draft budget to their parliament in mid-October. Parliaments all over Europe in functioning parliamentary democracies then get about two and a half months to debate those budgets. Um, this caused a problem in Ireland because, you know, things like the social welfare bill have to be come through. So what they did was they just moved the social welfare bill up. 
to the old December deadlines. They brought it through. We got it on a Wednesday. We had to have committee stage amendments in before we even made second stage speeches. It was guillotined in all stages. It went through, and uh, not a single letter was changed. So they've managed to circumvent the entire point of moving to the European semester. Nonetheless, uh, I think coordination of European budgets is a very good thing. Um, the fiscal compact was, was um, a very fractious debate. I thought about it long and hard and ultimately advocated a yes vote. And the more I think about it, the more I think that having those rules in place, like not being able to run crazy deficits, not being able to take in windfall money and turn it into structural cost, which is basically what we did with all the property money. We took one off cash and turned it into wages and other things, which obviously uh, uh, is not sustainable. And we got to bring our debt down over X number of years to 60% of GDP, and ultimately it'll go down lower. You know what? I think that's probably healthy. I can't really see too much downside to that. And I think the new common bank resolution thing is good. I think ECB regulation is probably a good thing. So there's, there's probably more, but there's three things where I think Europe financially will be stronger. Um, the negatives, I just listed three as well. The, the erosion of solidarity, I, I think, cannot be uh, overstated. If you talk particularly to the youth, right? If you talk to young people in Ireland, in, in, uh, in the UK, and abroad, the sense they get is they do not belong to the society. So young people I talk to in Ireland, maybe not in this room, because please God, you've all got great jobs and you're having a great time and doing good, good, good stuff. Um, but the young people I speak to who may not be as fortunate as some people in this room feel that they have been utterly stitched up and betrayed and now discriminated against for no other reason than they haven't reached the age of 26 yet. Um, I think the fracturing of solidarity across Europe cannot, the damage that, this, that, that, is, that is causing is very, very significant. I consider myself a proud European. I spoke in the European Parliament in Strasbourg on my 16th birthday. I have a far less healthy respect for the European project than I used to have, because I think it used to be based on ideals. And what I have seen triumph over that, I believe, I hope I'm wrong, but what, in, in my opinion, what has triumphed over that is raw, naked, bad national self-interest from a bunch of actors. Uh, and I, I, I think that's a problem. The other big problem, which is, which is correlated to this, is the inequality between the states. So inequality is going to rise. Inequality is a bad thing in all its forms. You may not need perfect equality, but there's all sorts of social theory and all sorts of economic theory that basically says equality is good. Everybody gains from equality. Um, and cross-border inequality is bad. Now, the, the, the cash transfers that have occurred, so remember, <coughs> The Europeans are not giving us any money. They are lending us money. We are paying all that money back, but we have given them money. So there's a bunch of money, for example, that will have gone back into Deutsche from all of your pockets um, that you will all, and I will all pay the interest in that for, for decades to come. So the, 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 the long-term inequality in Europe, I think, interstate has increased. I think that's a very bad thing. Um, and then I think there has been, at a philosophical level, a victory of capital over the citizen. And that might sound a bit melodramatic, but if you look back through history at kind of what causes bad things to happen, a lot of it has to do with capital swishing around the world, finding somewhere to go to, um, pulling out, uh, and leaving destruction. This kind of tsunami of capital kind of washes, washes around the world. Um, and I think we have seen, I think if, if you know, I, I love America, I've lived in America, I've studied in America, I've lived in a few different places, worked in the Middle East. There are some incredible things about Europe that are nowhere else in the world around human rights. Um, we hands down lead the world in terms of uh, environmental policy and in a bunch of other cool social things. And that lost in Europe to power, to capital, to wealth, and I think Europe lost something. I think it lost a bit of its soul. And it's interesting, when you hear some of the people who set up the European project, uh, that's what they talk about. They say this was set up around solidarity, it was set up around the citizen, it was set up, as, it was set up around ideals. And actually, you've betrayed that in the interests of power. So I, I, I probably should have started with the bad ones, because I've just brought everybody down, <laughs> including myself. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, I'm very disappointed with the European project, I have to say. I think, I think it is a bad time. Um, I know I'm probably way over time, so I'll just, I'll, the, the, the last one was basically 
Um, how do you have influence as, it does, to be honest, it doesn't really matter if you're an independent or a backbench TD or, or, or whatever, how do you have influence as a parliamentarian in a broken parliamentary system? Um, with great difficulty is, <laughs> is, is the answer. First thing you do is you try and put a fantastic team around you. So Dan here used to work with me, he interned with me. I got another fantastic intern working with me. Over the summer, we got a bunch of students in. So we probably had a team of four, five, six really smart young people working on all sorts of cool stuff, policy development, budget prep, all sorts of things. Uh, and I've got two full-time staff who are awesome and, and, and work their backsides off. So the first thing you do is you try and put the coolest team around you that you can, obviously. Um, because you can't possibly do it all on your own. Um, at the macro level, sorry, at the micro level, you can have really meaningful uh, change. You can really help people at an individual level, or sometimes at a community level, sometimes at community group level. Um, you can find you know, a mum with two kids who is literally homeless, a house, um, because the system isn't working properly, right? And because the right people in the system aren't talking to each other. You can connect people, you can kind of find ways of making things happen at the margin where they really need to happen. Not clientelist stuff, not vote getting stuff, none of that stuff. Um, all of the TDs do an awful lot of work at the margin of society where the system, where people fall through the gaps. People fall through the gaps all the time. Even the most carefully designed safety nets, you'll find says, well, actually, you know, she didn't work in this year, so she doesn't qualify for this, and actually not this either, or this, or this. You talk to the officials and they say, yeah, no, this is, this is a mistake in the system. So you can apply a little bit of common sense, you can bring a bit of influence in a good way um, there. Locally as well, at a slightly bigger level, you can, you can do some cool things. So like, for example, I'm working on a new strategy, job creation strategy for uh, three of the, well, one of the towns and some of the surrounding villages in, in, in Wicklow. Um, and I'm going to be doing more. So you can help kind of at a strategic level, at a convening level uh, within your constituency. Very, very important stuff. Um, occasionally, you can affect change through legislation. So I brought in something called the Family Home Protection Bill in 2011, um, which basically said the following. If someone is having their house repossessed, the law at the moment says the judge cannot apply any discretion whatsoever, even if the bank has been acting atrociously. And even if it is in everyone's interests that this family stay in the house, the judge has no power other than to enforce the possession order. Now they do. And it is a, it is a very serious and substantive change that Edmund Honan actually was talking about in the Irish Times the other day, saying this is, this is big stuff. Um, uh, Minister Shatter asked me to withdraw it. He said, it's your bill. We can't bring it in like this, but let's talk. Uh, and a few months ago, something called the Land and Conveyancing Bill came in. It did two things, two parts. Part one, reverse the done judgment. So houses can be possessed. I got an awful lot of heat for voting for that, but ultimately if a bank can't secure uh, the asset against its loan, there will be no housing market in Ireland and no one will be able to own their own houses. The second part was the Family Home Protection Bill. So that was pretty cool. Um, you can influence legislation through uh, committee, at, again at the margin, you know, and it depends on the minister. Some ministers are very open and some ministers are very closed. What I find is the ones, the, the, the smartest ones, the ones who are, mo who are best in command of their brief are the most open, as in any walk of life, right? And in my opinion, the people who are struggling are just not open to listening to anything kind of as a, as a, as a defensive mechanism. But there are things you can do. Um, one of the nicest things you can do, I don't know how much influence it has, but actually it's one of the best things about being a member of your national parliament is being able to give people a voice being able to give sort of people who don't have power and don't have representation and don't have money, um, giving them a voice is amazing, you know? And then going back, there's a, there's a fantastic school in North Wicklow that uh, works with special needs kids and adults. And I had made a speech about them and about what they were struggling with. I kind of thought nothing more of it. And then I was talking to one of the teachers a few months later and said, yeah, no, we brought all the kids and we brought the, the, the clients of the place in and we had it live. And they saw you representing them in Parliament. And it meant a huge amount to them. That is an amazing thing as a human being. It's an amazing thing to be able to give people a voice who don't have a voice themselves, who are kind of powerless. Um, and I guess... It, one of the other areas is, is electorally, right? If there's a referendum, you can actually help sway the referendum. So there was a really dangerous referendum, in my opinion, which was the uh, Rockets Inquiries Bill, which to me was McCarthyism. It was bad in an awful lot of ways. All of the political parties supported it. 
I brought it to the technical group, said this is wrong, this is McCarthyism, we should come out against it. A bunch of other people did, like a load of the ex-attorney generals or attorneys general. Um, and it got defeated by about two percentage points. And I think it swung from about 70% yes to being defeated on the night. Um, so you can have a little bit, of, little bit of influence there. And then hopefully, finally, this is kind of amorphous, but I hope you can have a little bit of influence by trying to do politics in a slightly different way, you know, um, and living it a bit differently, and recognizing that the doll is, contrary to what I believed before I went in, and contrary to what I think most of the public believe, um, the doll is full of really good people. I mean, really talented people, really hardworking people, working in a system that's broken, but that they want to fix. And I think through a bunch of people just doing things differently, I think the tanker that is our political system hopefully will begin, maybe it is a little bit already, I don't know, begin to, uh, begin to change. So can you have influence? Yes. It's hard. You have to get lucky. You have to be quite clinical about what you do. Um, but is it worth it? Yes, it is. So there you go. Thank you.